Hey everybody, it's David. So a few weeks back there was some really exciting news published in the journal Nature relating to the origins of life on the Earth. Alan Nutman and his team found evidence for the earliest life yet ever seen on the Earth. It dates back to 3.7 billion years ago. Specifically what they found were these fossilized microbial mats called stromatolites. They were found in southwest Greenland, and by radiometrically dating them, they can tell the age is 3.7 billion years old. This new discovery for the earliest life on the Earth predates the previous best record by about 200 million years. To put this number into some context, the Earth had only really recently formed by this point. In fact, the late heavy bombardment only ended at 3.8 billion years ago. So just 100 million years later, we find evidence for life on the Earth. So this discovery stirred up a lot of the speculation and conjecture that often goes with these types of discoveries, and that is that the early start to life necessarily implies that life therefore must be easy to get started. For example, there was an accompanying article actually published in Nature that even supports this hypothesis. It was by Abigail Orwood. She wrote, If life could find a foothold here, then life is not a fussy, reluctant, or unlikely thing. Give life half an opportunity and it will run with it. And she's not the only person to say that. Lots of astrobiologists, astronomers, physicists say the same thing, even in popular media. But let's take a step back and think really hard about whether we really believe this statement. To put it into context, I'm going to use an analogy. Imagine taking a million people and locking each and every one of them in separate rooms. Each of these rooms has a door to get out and it has a lock. And I'm going to give every single person a lock picking kit. Let's say that the lock they have to pick takes on average 12 hours for a person to open. But I only give each of those people one minute to open the door. Okay, so let's start the clock and see if any of these one million people can get out of the room in a single minute. Now, of course, most people don't succeed. They don't get through the door. But let's say that one person did get through. Let's call her Jane. And let's say that she got through that door in 10 seconds. Now, Jane is the only person out of this million people that got through the door. She's the only one. So she's the only one we get to speak to. And so we ask Jane, how hard was the lock to pick? And Jane would say, it was easy, it only took me 10 seconds. Now of course the other 999,999 people would completely disagree with that statement and they would say it was a really hard lock to pick, there was no way I could get through in one minute. But of course we never heard from those people, we only heard from Jane. So if we try to make inferences about how hard or easy the lock was to pick, just based off Jane's testimony, we're going to get the wrong answer. Now let's play the same game for Earth-like planets. Same idea. There are billions of Earth-like planets just in our Milky Way galaxy, and we can think of each one of those worlds as being like a locked room with a chance for life to arise, to get out of the room. We are Jane. We are the success. We're the only ones that we know of who managed to get out of the room. Now if that lock is really hard to pick, by which I really mean here, if the probability of life getting started on a planet is very, very low, then the fact that we are here and it happened quickly means nothing. It tells us no information about how difficult or easy life is to get going. What I'm really talking about here is the effect of selection bias. If you ever heard of the term the weak anthropic principle, this is another related concept. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, if the probability of life getting started is easy, then we can use the fact that life got started quickly to infer the rate. We can do it then. But if the probability of life getting started on the Earth is really small, then we can't use the time scale at which life started on the Earth to infer anything about the rate. It's not possible. So there are two scenarios there. Which one's the right one? Well, we don't know, and that's the whole point. But don't get me wrong, this discovery of an early start to life is incredible and amazing. But as tempting as it is to take that single piece of information that life got started quickly on the Earth and extrapolate that therefore the probability of life getting started everywhere is really easy, it's wrong. If we really want to get at the answer as to what is the probability of life starting, there are really two ways. We can try to detect life elsewhere in the universe, which would solve the problem for us. Or we can try to create life in the lab ourselves, or map the probability space of chemical networks. Actually, Caleb Sharp, an astrobiologist here at Columbia, actually shot a video you can click here to get about that. Right now, we don't really have a good answer. But that's okay. That's the way science works. We don't always necessarily claim that we know everything. Science is a process of discovering things and working things out. It is not just a body of textbooks and knowledge which have been pre-acquired. In fact, if you are an aspiring scientist, I hope that this major unsolved mystery in science 
gives you that encouragement that we don't know everything. In fact, there is work for you to do. We need young people to come into this field and try and solve these major problems. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do, make sure you like and share it. Also, if you haven't already, of course, click the subscribe button below so you can get all the videos from the CoolWorks lab here. So until next time, everybody, stay curious.